We should talk about the shootout because uh, it, it's an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, the thing that struck me seeing it on, on the big screen uh, with this incredible sound system as well um, is the, the sound of the guns. I mean, the, the reverb and the echo of those, is, is they're like no other machine guns I've heard in, in movies and you've heard millions of, of machine guns in movies. Are those production recordings of the downtown streets echoing? Was it done in post? I mean, how did you achieve that? Uh, those are basically production recordings. We had we had an accelerated post, and so we had one of the most ambitious mixing schedules I've ever had, where where uh, Chris Jenkins was on one stage. They would work from about I'd work there from about six o'clock in the morning till about two or three in the afternoon, and then Andy Nelson was across the street on another stage, and their crew would start at about noon or one o'clock. And we would and, work till and, nine and, or ten o'clock at night, home. and we would do. <laughs> we would. Okay. It was very long. Yeah. But the 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 gunshots were um, there was a, a there was was so stunning, but I think Lee, Lee Orloff was uh, was the sound machine, the production sound machine. The the actual gunshots in those canyons of buildings and the way that the sound reverberated and echoed around the buildings was unique. And there were full load blanks, so they were high-powered blanks. And it was frightening. You just stood there, and it was just a, it's a frightening sound. And um, so we had these really great production tracks. I had said that I really wanted to use those. Mostly when I got on the stage, I wound up with a, a, an elaborate set of cut sound effects, which we then dumped and went back to the, some of the production sound effects and mi yeah. mix the two together. But the, the, the mix is that these guys did, and it, uh, it's, it, I, I think it's exquisite. I mean, it surrounds yeah. you, and it's, there's, there are silences that make you focus visually into something happening in the center of the screen because of what the sound does. I mean, it's a real you know, brilliant mix that these guys did. It's, it's a fantastic mix. It's also got you know, wonderful control of music as well, and the, the music, I have to ask you about the music because it's it's so rare. There are so few filmmakers who are able to take such an eclectic group of composers and musicians and make it feel absolutely cohesive. So there's, I mean, you've got Brian Eno in there, you've got all kinds of ambient things, and then you've got Elliot Goldenthal's wonderful, very traditional classical sort of score coming in, but it all feels of a, of a piece. Is that, how did you go about sourcing all that? In, in the same way that this, it was the approach, and the approach was, was, was all generated kind of from the end of the film, but the, the idea was that we are discreetly immersed into the lives of these characters, and their lives and who they are as people make us feel certain ways, and that's going to determine their outcome. Then to kind of max out that polarity from character to character to character, whether it's Al or Bob or Breeden or Val or Sizemore, each one being different, uh, generate, though what I wanted to generate in Dante's brilliant work in the film, a different lighting style, a different way of shooting certain scenes, and then it, it argued for very, an, an eclectic um, use, of, use of, whether it's Moby or, or you know, Brian Eno or Cronus Quartet, and then Elliot Goldenthal's, Goldenthal's spectacular score. And, um, uh, and the commonality which puts them together just, is just the emotions of the story. But the idea of it being diverse and discreet was because everything was designed to focus towards the conclusion.